There was times throughout the pre-transplant process where it became apparent that as my primary advocate, I was the one who had to take a stronger role in ensuring my health and the best possible outcome of the transplant. And these mostly happened when I transitioned from my nephrology team to the pre-transplant team. While waiting for a donor and going through the pre-transplant process, I had to push back when I felt like my care team couldn't schedule me the appointments that I needed to get me timely answers to questions that I felt were important. For a quick example, I remember when I said I had over 60 interested donors, the first response from someone on my care team was, we really wish you let us know first before you were going to go viral. We don't have the staff to process that many interested donors. <laughs> um, and I was surprised that something that was such unadulterated good news to me could present problems for a world-renowned transplant hospital. Um, the care that we received both during and recovering from the transplant was top-notch, and the surgery itself was successful, and now I have a new baby. People always want to know about everything I had to go through, the restrictions I must have had before or still have on what I eat or drink or whether I feel different being down a kidney. But the truth is, from the very first hours of recovery, it was just not that big a deal. This might have been influenced by the fact that my roommate, for most of my two night stay at the Mass General, was a heart transplant recipient with multiple woes, so my situation truly paled in comparison. I was uncomfortable, to be sure. The particulars of expelling the gas used to inflate my belly so that Dr. Dagaford could reach in with her exquisitely small hands through the incision around my belly button to extract my left kidney. I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> I couldn't roll onto either side, and lying on your back is a drag after a while. Other than that, I was and remain in awe of both of us, filled with relief and joy. As the recipient, my recovery was longer and more complicated, but one year out, my new kidney is, as Genevieve and I like to joke, making beautiful hair. <laughs> <laughs> we do say that a lot, actually. <laughs> um, from a patient capacity standpoint, however, some of the same issues are now creeping up. Office wait times have increased significantly, face-to-face -face time with my doctor has decreased, probably in part because I don't need as much care as the new pre-transplant uh, pre patients do, but also in part because there are just too many people needing transplants today. I also had to switch doctors as mine had left for a new hospital. This impacted my ability to schedule appointments, and when I finally was able to schedule one, um, I had to explain my entire kidney history to a new doctor at my first visit. How can we ensure that patients' needs are being met when current systems can't always handle the number of patients in them? And as I alluded to before, I'm a millennial, and I know how to be pushy when I need to be, um, but what happens when a patient doesn't want to be pushy or doesn't have family to advocate for them? And what happens if a patient doesn't understand why a doctor or a nurse has made a particular recommendation and just won't question it? I tried to use the experience of being a patient to observe the medical world, but of course, on the donor end, there is no question of a capacity issue, such as Mike experienced. I was one of just 68 living donors at the Mass General in 2018, 68 patients in one whole year. The Dana-Farber successfully treats thousands of cancer patients each year. There may be no way to translate what it's like to have an urgent, life-threatening condition at age 79 into the revelation of being healthy enough to part with an organ. And yet, maybe the vision of that kidney team with a social worker and a nurse at its center could be applied across the medical world. That's what I keep seeing in my mind. When I was wrestling with the work of writing this story, Annie Brewster drew my attention to a way that my story did intertwine with my mother's. It's a little bit raw, but I can't get the image out of my head. I told you that we think that the removal of my mother's feeding tube might have contributed to her, to her death. It's a very common procedure, the tube being yanked out a little abruptly as she described it to us that night, but almost never dangerous. And yet there she was the next day, dead on the floor. I told this to Annie, and after a pause, she pointed out that I also had something removed from my body, but with care and thought and intention. And not only am I still here to tell the story, but just as importantly, so is Mike. So one year later, Genevieve and I have been using our platform as teachers to spread awareness about living organ donation, both in our school and in the wider Boston area. Um, this is our third speaking engagement after our own Health Story Collaborative feature this past May and we'll be on an upcoming <laughs> episode of the WBUR Kind World podcast. Um, I continue to speak on MGH panels for pre-transplant patients and volunteer for National Kidney Foundation events. 
And Genevieve is active with a donor support group convened every three months by social worker Judy Burrows at MGH. Through this group, she also supports the inception of a chapter of uh, WELD Well, where we encourage living donation, which is a national organization. And of course, here we are this morning, hoping that our continued efforts to share our various stories does help expand the conversation here at today's society tea table. The need to change the discourse is at the heart of your mission, and we have both lived that need in our own lives. We thank you for the opportunity to share a bit of our lives with you and welcome any questions you might have. about to donate a uh, kidney to her sister. Right. What should I do to help? Oh, that's such a great question. My, our school district was incredibly supportive. Um, they put us both on Family and Medical Leave Act for the leave so it didn't take from our sick days. Um, I think make sure that she knows she's gonna be tired. Like, I work half time and even still when I went back to work, I went back after about a month and so that was sort of early December, and it was until February that I was still feeling kind of, like fine, I could do my job, but just let her know she's gonna be really tired. Um, surgery is a big deal, and, um, but that's <laughs> wonderful, wonderful news, yeah. Any other questions? And I'll just say we'll be around for lunch too, yeah, yeah. so if you think of any, and wanna, we'll, we'll keep the super mentor promise <laughs> If I can just add, speaking of our school district, um, we got so many cards and presents right before the surgery, like overwhelming, including from a special ed assistant who I had never had in a class. We didn't really know her at all, and she gave us both these shirts. So that's that's our, it's just it's the love that people feel for you when you are going through something like this, and in our school um, that people felt was really really encouraging. So my question is, would you have considered? donating a kidney to someone you did not know? I think I would have. Um, I don't know how I would have heard, heard about it. I mean, you see it on Facebook, I suppose I did. <laughs> um, and it certainly meant something more to, to give it to someone that I care about. Um, but I like to think the people in my donor group were about half and half, do, you know, donating to someone you know and then also anonymous. And I think the anonymous donor people are almost, it's, that's such an amazing thing to, to just be part of that chain of life. They're often part of these large circles of donation, you know, so I, I like to think I would have. I, I don't get to find out. They don't let you donate any more organs. <laughs> 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 Where people are like, oh, the liver, the liver regrets, I can do that. And, and Judy is like, no, no. <laughs> Yes. Okay, why don't we break for lunch? Where is lunch? Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is amazing. So that those options are there for you. So we're gonna break for lunch, and I think we have, uh, for 